Day 328 of Heart Dive 365. I'm your Bible study friend, Holly, and welcome to the Heart Dive podcast. Hi, we're diving into the book of Galatians in the middle of the book of Acts. Remember, we're walking in chronological order, so don't get confused as we bounce around. So Paul is writing a letter to Galatians today, and we're going to find out why this is a fiery letter and what they call the mini Romans. It's a really good book to read, especially if you're trying to grapple with the understanding of what salvation truly means, especially when it comes to grace versus works. All right, before we dive in, I want to say thank you and welcome to our Bible study. We're Heart Dive 365 reading plan right now as we walk chronologically through the Bible. And if you're brand new around here, we love knowing where you're checking in from or how you found out about us. Let us know in the comments down below. Now, if you're part of the Heart Dive fam, you know what I'm going to say. Can you hit the roll call button? Uh, it's the like button down below and subscribe if you haven't already. And don't forget about the notifications bell these last couple days. If you're in real time, you've probably noticed that we're not dropping them at exactly the same time like we normally do. But again, within 72 hours, that's not going to matter anymore. But right now, if you're following us right here in 2024, you know we're kind of off schedule. And so the notification bell is your way of knowing when things are dropping. Um, us here, Kanoi and I, we drop the emails Monday through Friday as often as we possibly can but again we're in real time so if we drop a video at 8 p.m. and I'm on Eastern time I might not send that email until the next day and then we both have children and busy schedules and we do this YouTube thing in our margins and so we don't have a regular cadence or schedule that's the beauty of being able to film things in our spare time but also it's also one of the discrepancies that we can have in the sense that it, it may seem like we're on a regular schedule, but we're not. She drops that video. I see it posted. I get in as quickly as I can. But if I'm at a gymnastics practice, swim practice, baseball tournament, wrestling meet, or I'm sick with a two-year-old, I just can't get to it in that time. And so it might drop the next day or the day after that. So thank you for the grace. Thank you for the patience and thank you for understanding that we really truly try to place our relationships with our Lord and Savior, our husbands and our children before this YouTube thing, before this camera thing online. And we appreciate it so, 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 so much. Okay, before we dive into Galatians, let's bow our hearts in prayer before we read from the ESV. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this time. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this fiery Paul that you gave this God made revelation to that through him we have so many amazing books to better understand what you did for us on the cross allow our hearts to be allow our hearts to be open uh, ready for the cultivation of your word today Lord that it will take root and grow so that we may abide in you and not ourselves, that we will bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit through salvation, Lord. Thank you for the grace. Oh, thank you, thank you. Thank you for the, the sacrifice that you made for me and for everyone listening, for everyone who's on the cusp of truly surrendering all to you, because Lord, you did. You surrendered it all on the cross. Allow your words in Galatians to come alive for us today, Lord. Empty us of ourselves. Let go of any bitterness, transgressions, or distractions keeping us from your word today. In Jesus' name, we pray. Don't forget that over in the Bible Project, you can get those posters of the many books. And so this is Galatians. And we are looking at maybe it being written between 47 to 50 AD. Um, the author has never really been much of a debate. There are some who try, but for the most part, it is a Pauline epistle. So it was written by the Apostle Paul. And to the church of Galatia and that is modern day Turkey back then it was the Roman province in Anatolia and it was the southern region is what people agree there is a northern and a southern region but a very large colony uh, and so a very wide expanse of area that a church has been planted for the way for believers in Jesus Christ so what is it in a nutshell it would be how does the gospel of Jesus Christ affect the Jewish slash Gentile nation, not Jewish or Gentile, but together as a whole. And 
one of the biggest themes is justification by faith alone. And that matters because a lot of people will say, show me your salvation by the justification. And if the justification is works, then Galatians will prove it wrong. Galatians is going to teach us, show us, proof to us through the words of Paul, a man chosen by God, that our justification is done and paid for through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ on the cross. And by his grace, through our faith, do we earn salvation. That's it. Okay, let's go. Galatians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead and all the brothers who are with me, to the churches of Galatia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished. Okay. <laughs> I, did, I just wanted to say, show you the salutation of this letter. And then the very next line is, I am astonished. He is breaking protocol here. Some sermons out there literally will just sit in verses one through five, just those alone, and dive into why he is writing this letter. So we just read Acts 15 and 16. And so we know that there is a debate about circumcision. And so therefore false gospels and doctrines are running amok. And so here, this letter was written to the Galatians, perhaps before he went and had the council in the book of Acts, right? In Jerusalem. And so this is his fiery response that, oh my gosh, I cannot believe I came, I gave you the word of God. And now you're just being so easily led astray. He's hot. He's mad. And this letter, they say, was perhaps written before that council and in the early days of this church. He's avoiding some of the regular salutations that, you know, uh, giving them encouragement or praising them. He, he avoids some of that. And he does point out two things right out gospel in itself, that he was appointed not by man, but by God. And that this is through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So in verse six, he just jumps right into why he's so upset and sending this letter. And he goes, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one right there. He's saying there isn't another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we are an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say it again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. In verses six through seven, Paul is astonished. Why is he astonished? Because they were so quickly bewitched and fooled into this false doctrine, which we need to be able to determine the true gospel from the fake teachings that are going around. The true gospel centers on Jesus Christ's death and resurrection with no additions and no distortions. That's it. And it's critical to us, all right? It's critical to us to stay grounded in the word of God so that we can discern truth from error. So heart check. Are you discerning the gospel you hear or share with others? And how can you ensure it aligns with the truth of scripture? Not once, but twice. And he's saying accursed. Accursed means to be damned, destruction, eternal damnation. He is treating this like a life and death situation. Like, okay, back off, you know, Paul, simmer down. And he's like, no, no, I will not simmer down because this is a life or death situation. If you attach yourself to a gospel that is different from the gospel and you're holding on to something that's going to lead you astray and actually lead to eternal damnation, he's hot and angry about it and saying, no, 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 no. I gave you a path to a righteous life that is imputed through Jesus Christ that will have eternal salvation in the kingdom of heaven. And he continues in the same vein as he defends his testimony and defends his role that he was given by Jesus Christ 
For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. He's talking about the law. But when he had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace. How did he call him? By grace. Not by works. Not by law. Not even by the covenant. By his grace. Was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone. So he was given this revelation, right? But he did not immediately go to the disciples, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. So we know here this is three years. So the disciples were able to walk in step with Jesus Christ. They were able to learn so much. And we have seen many of them grow up. Remember Peter? All right. We got Simon Peter to Peter, right? He's now walking strong in his faith. He's not making those same mistakes. So the disciples got to walk with Jesus. They got to mature in their faith. They got to be sanctified, right? They were continually set apart. They had time to be trained up. Well, Paul needs to do the same thing. So he went out to Arabia and to Damascus, and he did his training up there with the Holy Spirit and studying what has already been provided in letters, that the fact that his testimony speaks volumes. This was a man who was killing believers for the sake of the covenant and for the law and for that legalistic view of the religion of the Jewish people. And he has now done a 180, right? He has completely turned a different direction. That speaks volumes. And so I'm going to challenge anyone who's watching, listening right now, that your testimony could be the seed that needs to be planted, okay? But again, it's not our words, but it's the word of God that will transform hearts, that will pierce bone and marrow. So after he went to Damascus, in verse 18, then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas. Now, Cephas is the Hebrew name of Peter. All right, so he went to visit Cephas and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. In what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. He's saying, you can go and ask them. I am not lying that I did go and sit with them to substantiate, to prove that the message I have was the same one that they had. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only were hearing it said, he used to persecute us, is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy, and they glorified God because of me. Chapter 2. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation set before them. Though privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. So here he said he confirmed that he was saying the same message as them. So he wasn't saying anything in vain. He wasn't giving false doctrine. That was very important to Paul. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. So he's saying that as a Gentile, Titus was not forced to do the circumcision, which is what he is fighting against right now, is that circumcision, going back to Acts chapter 15, he is talking about that same subject matter that these people, some people were saying that circumcision was required necessary for salvation. Yet, because of false brothers secretly brought in who slipped in to spy out our freedom, key, we have freedom in our salvation. And he's saying they were spying out our freedom. And this comes to that easy believism that people just can't seem to wrap their mind around that this is a free gift. And in this free gift, we have freedom from sin. Like, It is, and and, and before you say anything about freedom from sin, does not give us license to sin in our freedom. We will get to that in chapters five and six. But here he is saying they were spying out our freedom. It's just so hard for our human nature to accept 
this free gift and that there is nothing that we have to do to earn it. Nothing. Just laying that out there. All right. So they were spying out their freedom that we have in Christ Jesus so that they might bring us into slavery. To them, we did not yield in submission even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. They're saying they did not yield even for a moment to the legalism and the laws and the rules that the law brought against them. And from those who seem to be influential, what, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. Okay, this is something that we really need to hold on to, bite into, okay? Don't take my word for anything. Only take the word of God. Don't take Kanoi's word. Don't take blank. Put whoever, the pastor, influencer, big name on the platform person, don't take their word for it, okay? Always, always hold the truth of whatever they're saying up to the examination of the Bible. Examine it with the word of God. Do not, he's saying, do not take, just because they're famous, just because they're popular, do not take it as truth. And that's what was happening. These bigger names, these Pharisees or these Jewish believers, Jews who believe in Jesus Christ, who would show up on the scene and say, oh, I'm, I'm big name, whoever in this, you know, church game. Listen to me. I know what I'm talking about. But they weren't sent with authority, especially the authority of God that Paul had. That's why he spent so much time talking about his testimony. And right here, he's saying influencers have nothing to add. Nothing. It's the word of God. That's what we stand on here at Heart Dive. That's what we will continue to stand on. If we ever say anything, go back to the word of God, give it to the Holy Spirit and discern it. In verse seven, on the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, that's the Gentiles, the nations, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, the Jewish, the Jewish community, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. So be aware of false doctrines of the wolves. We are sheep in the wolves den, right? And then second, get confirmation of wise counsel of those who know the word of God. If you ever have questions and then hear who you might go and disciple, because that is the next thing that we are to do. We are to be fed by the word of God. We're then to equip ourselves, ourselves through sanctification. And then we're supposed to go and do the work. Who Paul went to speak to were the Gentiles, to the unbelievers who were not Jewish descent while Peter and the apostles did go to the Jews. So who you might speak to might be a completely radically different community than who I and Kanoi speak to, right? Who Kanoi and I speak to. <laughs> and so here I am speaking to people in South Georgia. Maybe you can speak to people in a prison ministry, or maybe you speak to the older generation because you're retired and you're in some kind of legacy Bible study, or maybe you're going through cancer and you're now able to speak to people in a cancer support group. The community you need to speak to, the Lord will reveal to you just like he did here. So continuing in verse 11, but when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by his hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? In a nutshell, don't be a hypocrite. Yeah. 
That is the number one complaint I get when I talk about being a Christian, going to church, and why people aren't in a church or in fellowship. I just feel like hypocrites. Hypocrites. You live one way, you teach one way, and you don't follow either, pretty much. He's saying, you don't need circumcision, and you don't need all these works-based things for your salvation. You don't, it's not required. And he was sitting, and he'd have dinner with them. And then as soon as this influential crowd who were of the circumcised doctrine showed up, he started singing a different tune. And he's saying, what is this inconsistency? Even you can't even live like a Jew 24 seven, but you expect the Gentiles to just pick this up and do it. Okay. Bring it to today. Practical application. You go to a church and someone's like, you should not drink. You should not smoke cigarettes. You should not. Da, 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 and they just give you all these lists of things that you do. And then what if you're out and about and you see that exact same person at a bar having a drink? Or you see that exact same person who told you not to blank, whatever it may be, whatever sin, nature, rule, legalistic thing they're told you not to do, you catch them in the act of doing. That's hypocritical. That's saying one thing, doing another thing. Let this be a warning to us that one, we don't live a hypocritical life and we don't then encourage hypocrisy among believers. And two, this is called exhortation. This is hard. Can you do this in humility and love? So continuing in this grace message in verse 15, we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. We are not justified by what we do. You can't earn your salvation. In verse 17, but if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. In verse 17, what he is saying here is that the argument from that group of believers who believed works was needed, they said that grace wasn't enough that in grace, people would actually become more rebellious, bigger sinners, and sin more and more. They would give them license in their flesh to sin. And Paul is saying, excuse me, is, is Christ a servant of sin? He's certainly not. He, Paul's got a little bit of a sarcastic nature to the way that he writes. And you see that if you, you know, as we go through all his epistles and he say, no, Christ wasn't a servant of sin. He wasn't bound and enslaved to his sin nature. He was perfect. He fulfilled prophecy. He was, he was one who knew no sin. And how is that possible for us? Again, chapters five through six, we'll talk about this more. It's a sanctification process. The closer we get to God, the more that we leave the old life, life behind. Romans 12 too, right? Be trans transformed by the renewing of your mind, all right? So we're not conforming to the world so that we will know God's perfect and pleasing and goodwill. So the more that we work towards knowing Jesus, the more that we work towards being obedient in God in our grace relationship, the actually more of a servant we will become and less of that rebellious nature. So in verse 18, for if I rebuild what I tore down, that is the law, I proved myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ, right? There's a lot of different ways of interpreting that. But for me personally, I look at it symbolically and spiritually. I have been crucified, you know, because I believe in that I'm a new creation in God through my salvation. So here he's saying, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. The law is impossible to keep. The law is impossible to follow. The law points 
that finger. It just points the finger at us and it says, you are not enough. You can't earn it. You can't do this. You, you, you. Point, point, point. And grace says, you're, you're welcome however you are. You're welcome to your open arms looking for restoration, redemption. And Paul is saying that the law has no grip on him anymore. He has died trying to please God with the law. Because remember in chapter 15, it says that the yoke that neither we nor our forefathers could bear. He couldn't complete the law enough to earn his salvation. And he's saying it no longer even holds any kind of bondage over him. He has died to it. But that very last line is so important because we need to ask ourselves, if we add anything to salvation, is Christ enough? Is Jesus enough? Because if you add anything to his death for salvation, then it was for nothing. It is a free gift of grace. It is not earned. So heart check. Are there areas in your life where you rely on your own works or effort to feel justified before God instead of fully trusting in his grace? Galatians chapter 3. Oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly betrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having been gone by the spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain? If indeed it was in vain, does he who supplies the spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And so you see here, Paul was rebuking the Galatians for adding to the gospel. They're saying that through their works, through the law, they were trying to perfect their salvation through human efforts, which is not possible. That's why it's important to reflect on God's spirit-filled leading in our life and that we rely on God's power, not our own. Not our own strength, not our own merit, not our own effort. You see, it's the spirit that sanctifies and empowers us to live in God's will. So heart check. Are you leaning on the Holy Spirit for guidance, growth, and strength? Or are you trying to rely on your own effort to live a holy life? Know then that it is those of faith who are sons of Abraham and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. He's saying you were already given the message, the true message, the gospel, the one and only doctrine. How quickly, how easily you were misaligned and bewitched and turned away from the good news. So now here you are given the Holy Spirit, given this freedom And yet you think that you're going to earn heaven with works on top of that? How foolish are you to think such a thing? And then he brings in Old Testament scripture and he is explaining to them that before the law of Moses, which people were heralding as almost on equal ground as Jesus, that we need to follow his law as well as believe in Jesus Christ. He's saying before Moses showed up with the covenant law, Abraham was known as a man of faith, that the covenant with Abraham was given through faith. It was not works that he did. He was the first Jew, the first one. He was chosen by God that all of his descendants, which you'll see as he explains in the rest of the chapter and in chapter four, that we are descendants of him as well, spiritual descendants, heirs. And so the covenant that was established with Abraham was through faith, through belief, in God. Not works. So in verse 10, for all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. All right. A curse, a burden, a yoke. For it is written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. For the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse 
of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. All right. Remember, tree was the capital punishment for criminals. So yes, a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. We are promised salvation by faith in the Holy Spirit by that faith. All right. There are six points that Paul is proving in these next two chapters, chapter three and four, which we'll get to four tomorrow. So I want to share those with him, with you. It comes from the new Bible commentary that I was able to use using the logo software. So here we go. One, by grace, salvation in the Holy Spirit are given. Abraham was also saved by grace. Grace gives redemption and salvation. The law brings condemnation. Four, Abraham was saved by grace almost 100 years before the law was given. He even quotes it later down as 430 years, okay, between the covenant law and when Abraham created his relationship with God, establishing that covenant with God. And then in the fifth point, the law's purpose is to guide us and lead us to Jesus, and then his sixth point is by grace alone, a love relationship is built with God in one another. It is by grace that we're able to have an intimate relationship with God, right? That redeeming, restorated relationship with God in with one another is by grace. And then we can see a little bit of Paul's backstory remember his Jewish heritage coming out as he quotes scripture he clearly understands scripture Old Testament covenant theology and he's using it here to prove that Jesus Christ was the answer in all of it so he continues to explain this to give a human example brothers even with a man-made covenant no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. Now in your version, it might say seed, offspring or seed is singular here, speaking of the coming Messiah, which was Jesus. It does not say into offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one and to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void for if the inheritance comes by the law it no longer comes by promise but God gave it to Abraham by a promise a promise the very first covenant relationship was ratified and created from a promise by faith not by Abraham's works no he trusted God it is through trust that this was established. So in verse 19, why then the law? Then why did we need law? Why did we need religion? Why did we have rules? Why did he give the commandments? Why did he give all these little things that you should do this? Don't do this. Do this. Don't do this. Why? Why the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come. Jesus Christ came, right? Before he came, the offspring should come to, to whom the promise had been made. It was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came. Did y'all catch all that? Yeah, I know. That was a lot. That was heavy. Let's sum it all up, right? So what he is saying here. Oh, it's so good once you can see this and you realize this, right? Is that after Abraham's covenant relationship was built, right? Built on faith through trust, right? He trusted God. He had faith in God. He then 
created a temporary guide, a guardian, a teacher, a mentor, which was the law. And the law imprisoned us kind of under that sin. I know it, it's kind of like, what? So what he said is like the law magnified and guided us to realize our sin nature, that we, we can never earn our salvation. It just magnified, amplified all our sin, all our transgressions, everything that we just, we can never measure up to. But the seed, the offspring, singular, was able to fulfill that law. And so we use the law until he came on the scene. So in Jesus Christ, he fulfilled the law because he did everything according to the law and he knew no sin. And that is what verse 23 is about. When the coming faith will be revealed. These are the mysteries. This was the mystery of the Old Testament that is now revealed. Jesus Christ. So continuing in verse 24, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all, oh, this is so good. You, you, the one listening right now, you are all sons and daughters of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. No distinction, y'all. There is no distinction. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. We are, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are an heir to the righteousness of Christ through faith. And so for our deep dive questions today, what does it mean to live by faith and not by works in your daily walk with Christ? How can we recognize when we are slipping into legalism in our relationship with God? What practical steps can you take to focus more on the gift of grace rather than striving to earn God's approval? What are some modern day distortions of the gospel and how can we identify them? Why is it important to hold firmly to the true gospel even when it challenges cultural norms? How can we lovingly correct others when we see them straying from the truth of the gospel? How can you cultivate a deeper reliance on the Holy Spirit in your daily life? And what are some ways the Holy Spirit equips and empowers believers to live out the gospel? How can you discern between spirit-led conviction and human-driven guilt? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. We are in awe of your grace that frees us from the burden of works and striving. Help us to cling to the true gospel and discern truth from distortion in a world filled with distractions. May your Holy Spirit teach us to rely on your power to guide, sanctify, and strengthen us as we live out your faith. May we walk boldly in the freedom you have given us, sharing your love, your truth with others. And let our lives be a testimony to the grace of the gospel and a reflection of your goodness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Heaven and salvation is a divine gift that is given to us by grace. None of us deserve it. In fact, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death and every single one of us have fallen short and then we desperately need someone to pay that price. And Jesus did it. He didn't do it because we are righteous on our own merit. He did it because he loves us and he wants to spend eternity with us. But it won't happen if we don't receive him before we leave this earth as Lord and Savior. Hell is a very real thing, and there is no second chance after we take our last breath here. So I want to be able to give someone the opportunity today who is saying, I'm ready. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm going to end up after I die. But I don't want to live another day without knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt where I am going to end up. I see now that this is real and I want to believe. 
So if that is you, we're going to say a prayer. And I'm going to put the words on the screen so that you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that he died and rose again, then you will be saved. So we're going to say this prayer together. Believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came, you died, and you rose again. I confess my sins to you today, and I turn from them, and I now live my life for you. I know that I am forgiven of all my sins, so I receive you now as Lord and Savior, and I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.